Hello, everyone, and welcome. Oh, boy, it's an exciting world out there. There are earthquakes, there are floods, there are fires, there are disasters of unknown types, there are tsunamis headed our way right now, or little waves, who knows, it's hard to know. Perspective, right? Um, and today we have a panelist of experts who will help us relate to all of that and how does that impact you, your clients, and your business. And so every so often we will remind them that we are realtors and that we have clients who are trying to buy properties and clients who are selling properties. And we have this new world in which we say to ourselves, it's how much for insurance? We're in Oakland and we are in Montclair and Janiel can tell us a little bit about the Montclair and she can say to us, yes, it's true. To get a regular house in Montclair, it's now three or $4 million and to get property insurance, just a regular policy, it's 40 and $50,000 and more. And you say to yourself, oh my God, how did that happen? Well, maybe today we'll find out how that happened. So I am Dan Hershkowitz. I am a past president of the San Francisco Association of Realtors. I am a realtor. I am part-time lawyer. I am the director of risk management for a company called Compass. And I talk to agents all the time up and down Northern California about this and many other issues. And every so often I may intervene and say, well, wait a minute, what should our realtors do? How does that impact us? But first of all, we're gonna say thank you so much to each of our panelists. Let me introduce them and then we will get started. I'm not saying that she's the best, but I'm saying that she has the most impressive resume and her name is Janiel Maffei. Did I say Maffei right? You did, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, good, I feel good. We're off to a good start. Uh, Janiel is with the CEA. Does anybody know what that is? California Earthquake Authority. Yes, Janiel, Janiel. and so does Pamela. Pamela has the logo over her back uh, right shoulder. And Pamela is joining us also today with the California Earthquake Authority. Now, what about Janiel? Well, Janiel joined the CEA uh, as Chief Mitigation Officer in May 2011. So it's been more than 10 years. How did that happen, right? I know. Yeah. Uh, she's responsible for the mitigation plan that includes California Residential Mitigation Program, and we'll find out more about that, and the development of comprehensive guidelines for the retrofit of single family dwellings. So when we talk about soft story, right, and we talk about what can be done, guess what? That is Janiel's department. And by the way, I listened to you once on a, another Zoom webinar, and I really enjoyed it. It was focused, that one, believe it or not, on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion issues and realtors. And I'm not sure how it all got brought together, but it did, and you were great. So thank you. Um, so what about Janiel? She's a graduate of UC Berkeley, where she obtained her AB. What does AB stand for? Uh, Arch you know, I, it's, it's a Bachelor of Arts, but for some reason, the architecture department was backwards. And now I don't remember why. Okay. So I think of a BA as a Bachelor of Arts. And that's what it was. Right. Maybe it's a Latin for Archibaculariate or something. Who knows? Uh, in architecture, which I think is great and relevant here, and an MS in civil engineering, also incredibly relevant to this discussion. She's also a reg registered structural engineer who has worked in the earthquake engineering industry for over 38 years. And her experience includes the design of new building structures, seismic strengthening of existing structures and post earthquake uh, reconnaissance. That's interesting. So you go out and you look at a property after right and you're doing a little post-mortem so to speak on it that's right all right um from what loma prieta northridge and who knows what the next one is going to be called yeah yeah thank you so much for being here thank you oh and are we going to screen share um in fact you're going to in a moment but let okay. me use aaron and jude and then we'll get started with your you got it of the program okay and by the way, I purchased some earthquake insurance literally two days ago. So we can talk about what I purchased and how it's not the right thing. Um, okay, what about Jude? Jude Winterhalter. Jude Winterhalter, how are you? Good, I'm doing great. Jude, what is Winterhalter? Thanks Winter for having me. I have, to feel, I have a feeling Winterhalter translates directly to something. Uh, I don't know. 
Oh, okay. We got to find out. So if somebody knows yeah. <laughs> that, and we'll find out, it might mean like mild winter for all I know. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Jude is the Jude. I think, you know what? I think it means winter on a hillside. I love it. And it sounds picturesque. We'll have to do something with it. Uh, Jude has frozen for a moment. Hopefully you can still hear us. There you are again. Yes. Jude is the founder of Jackson Square Insurance Associates Incorporated. He founded his own agency in 2014. So you're soon celebrating a 10 year anniversary. And he's been a property yes. broker since 2003. So that's almost 20 years. His independent agency specializes in helping commercial property owners understand their insurance policies and manage their risk portfolios. So you do mostly commercial, is that right? Uh, that is correct, yes. Okay. So it'll be- uh, Probably, uh, yeah, eight, eight, probably 80% 80 80 of my practice is commercial. You know what, Jude, let's do this. Let's turn your camera off for a little while, see if yeah. that loosens you up a yeah. little bit. And it'll be interesting to see your perspective with these realtors, some of whom do commercial work as well, of course, many of whom do residential. And Aaron, I want to make sure that I pronounce your last name right. I want to say Thack because of Mr. Thackeray and Notting Hill, my favorite movie of all time. But I think you say Thatch. Is that right? Thatch. Correct. Thatch. Okay. And as, as a TCH sound in the middle, but no T in the middle. As in a thatched roof, which is going to get blown exactly. up. Exactly. Yep. Not Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. Very hard to get insurance coverage for a thatched roof. <laughs> Uh, you all will be surprised to find out that Aaron is with something called farmer's insurance. Who would have known? Right. Uh, he's, a, he's been an agent for farmers for the past eight years and a total of 16 years in the insurance industry. Aaron specializes in issuing condos, standalone homes, warehouses, and HOA building policies. He's passionate, I tell you, passionate about educating his clients so they understand the importance of insurance and providing world-class customer service. Thank you, Aaron Thatch, for being here. Thank you for having me. And Pamela makes things happen at the CEA. I don't have your bio, Pamela, but tell us where are you from? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yes. Um, I coordinate community relation events like this. So I've been helping Janelle. She's the speaker for the California Earthquake Authority. I also work for the communications department at the California Earthquake Authority as an information officer. And um, well, the speaker who is representing us okay. is Janelle. And, um, and so Pamela, if you have any resources for us, perhaps because you have so much communication experience, you can drop them into the chat from time to time. Definitely, I'm ready to do that. Thank you. Janelle, why don't you take it away? Excellent, thank you. So it's RTM Baccalaureus. Oh, RTM Baccalaureus. So it Baccalaureus, is I think it is, yes. So you are correct. Yeah, it's and, Latin. And my, my Latin, not, not so good. Not either. <laughs> yeah. I'm 30 years from law school, so. Exactly. Well, you get more you get more um, in law school than you certainly do in architectural engineering. So thank you, Daniel. And can you see get prepared on your screen? I can. I see a lovely family about to be prepared for the earthquake that's coming to ruin their lives. Exactly. And, and it's a metaphor that um, our purview is single family dwellings. And of course, it's the single largest purchase that most of us will make in our lives as well. Of, uh, it, it's our home. It's where our family sleeps. And so very, very important. So I want to give you, um, you know, a little bit of the, the chicken little, you know, the sky is falling. We're talking about earthquakes, earthquake country, but also some solutions. And I think that that's the most important thing, if anything we've learned in this in this pandemic. California, earthquake country home to two thirds of our nation's earthquake risk. Alaska has more earthquakes, we have more people, and we've strategically placed them along the San Andreas Fault. Most mm -hmm. Californians within 30 miles of an active fault, um, really truly like 85% live along the coast in um, highly seismic areas. Here's San Francisco. There's that what we call the San Francisco earthquake, but let's be very clear, it was the Northern California earthquake, 250 miles of fault rupture, really strong shaking from al almost Eureka down to below um, Salinas. Uh, very important that everybody realizes that the larger the earthquake, the larger the fault rupture, the more area that's affected, the longer the earthquake, just more and more damage. 
Loma Prieta, on the other hand, 70, 90 miles from San Francisco. So really poorly designed structures, older ones, especially poorly designed structures like marina and um, freeways on soft soil or damaged. Uh, really not the test of major areas in the Bay Area, particularly uh, the East Bay, um, which is at risk from a, a Hayward Fault. And there's a comparison of the, you know, the, the area that was affected in Loma Prieta is so much smaller than in a larger earthquake like you saw in 1906. But definitely let's just you know, concede, we live in earthquake country. Let's take a couple of myths, get them out of the way. The government is not there as an insurance company. FEMA provides government assistance for urgent health and safety needs. Um, and the reality is that if you have means, if you're paying a mortgage, your application goes over to the SBA for a low interest loan and loans need to be paid back your previous mortgage or your standing mortgage, of course, not forgiven. Most importantly, residential policy does not cover earthquakes in California, specifically separated. That's an important part of why the CEA was created. Um, but uh, it, like flood, you know, there is a separate earthquake policy that's required and is available. So why was it separated? 1984, when the MAC came out, it was completely separated. And but at the same time, the legislator said we want to make it available. So uh, separated, but must be available. So if a company writes a homeowner's policy in California, they must offer earthquake insurance. Homeowner is not obligated to purchase it, but it must be offered. Along comes the Northridge earthquake in 1994, $40 billion in damage, half of that residential, half of that insured. They lost their shirts. Modeling was at its infancy. Um, just a tremendous impact, and they were going to stop writing policies in California. So the legislature stepped in once again and created the California Earthquake Authority, a not-for-profit provider of residential earthquake insurance. I think we have something like 70% of the market in California. Publicly managed, privately financed. So publicly managed, our board, and we're actually going to have a board meeting today, uh, includes designees that represent the three top elected officials. Bagley Keen, open meetings, open procurement, all of that as if we're an agency, but not an agency. Instrumentality of the state. So we're privately financed. Money came from participating insurers who joined us, as well as over a million policyholders who provide premiums every year. Um, so earthquake insurance, it is expensive. I live, uh, my husband and I are both structural engineers. We live, I call it spitting distance to the Hayward Fault. Um, and I will tell you, our earthquake insurance is more than three times what our policy is for, for fire. Um, but we are retired, we have equity, and um, the, the reality is that it is a huge part of our portfolio. But people should shop around. It's not always, CEA is, is not always gonna be the most competitive. We want people to be insured. We don't consider people writing policies to be our competitors. So go to our free estimate on CEA, look up what it is. It'll be exactly what you would be quoted from one of our, our participating insurers. And it gives you all kinds of information about what a deductible is, how you, um, you, you might have a different deductible for non-structural, et cetera. So lots of important information. Absolutely look into it. If you have equity in your home, if you're, if you're you know, getting close to retirement, you might be in an entirely different place than obviously when you're just starting out. There are participating insurers. We don't sell the, the policy. These folks do. Go ahead. Thank you, Janelle. I appreciate that. So very good. But I just do have a quick question. Yeah. When we are purchasing and you have this list of all of these people, is the policy actually coming from them or it's really coming from the CEA and they're just our conduit to buying it? And so- Perfect. Perfect segue. <laughs> exactly. So we, we have a state farm homeowners policy. So we contacted them. They gave us a quote on the CEA policy. We purchased it from state farm in the event of an earthquake, they would, they would come out and adjust the claim. We would get a CEA check. So CEA is managing the, the financing, the reinsurance behind the scene. Um, but we are not recreating the insurance companies. You would still be dealing with your insurance company. But the insurance, the, who, who actually collects the premiums and who writes the check? We, uh, I write my CEA policy to the um, State Farm and they pay the California Earthquake Authority. And then when a claim happens, is... it would be CEA check. Check, okay. And just, mm -hmm. I, and I wasn't joking, I literally two days ago bought a supplemental policy. Yeah. I have a townhouse, so you could call it a condo policy. Mm -hmm. We don't have a master policy for earthquake, but I nonetheless bought one. Why? Because in the event of an earthquake, none of the things that are in my condominium supplemental policy would apply. So That's right. if and when we rebuilt all of the finishes that are the new flooring, the new cabinetry, the new paint, the new, 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 all from the walls in, 
none of that would be covered by my supplemental policy because it wasn't a hazard that's covered. Um, and more importantly, where would I live during this reconstruction, which is going to be a year or more? And exactly. so, and so I have one hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of coverage to go rent an apartment somewhere else. And my thought was, you think rents are high now? Wait till everybody's displaced from an earthquake. Exactly. You know, and, and I will tell you that the, the loss of use is the most important and the renter's policy is the most inexpensive. That loss of use is huge as well as for condo. And their condo, of course, everything that you're responsible for is studs in. Um, so great policies. We also uh, have policies for mobile homeowners. And then, of course, um, you know, the kind of traditional single family homeowner. So thank you for that. that that's just, spot on. Just another note as well, too. Um, your earthquake policy for um, for your HO6 uh, condo policy has something called loss assessment. So even though your HOA doesn't may not have a master earthquake policy, when they bill you what's called a special assessment or loss assessment, that hundred thousand dollars maximum on your CA policy will pay for that. Yeah. When you, your 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 cost of share for the HOA when they bill you to rebuild the entire exterior common area, etc. Yeah, that's very nice. I didn't understand that. And just for yeah. a little context for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, my home isn't worth all that much in San Francisco standards. Uh, I bought 2,000 square feet worth about probably 1.6. Um, my supplemental uh, HOA policy is annually about $900. This earthquake policy was a little bit more than that, about $1,100 uh, annually, just to give people some context. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. Please go on. Okay. No worries. So I'm, I'm just gonna segue a little bit. Financially, really strong. We have $9.5 billion in reinsurance, which of course is insurance for insurance companies. Um, that $6.2 billion in capital is very important because we, from day one, were charged with mitigation as well as risk transfer. So 5% of investment income or up to $5 million a year goes into a mitigation fund that, that my team and myself as the chief mitigation officer manage. And let me tell you a couple more things that we're doing. We're trying to not only transfer risk, but we're trying to reduce risk, reduce damage. Um, so we've identified you know, the top uh, damaging element for single family dwellings, cripple wall. Uh, older house pre-1980, studs around that crawl space, not properly anchored or braced. That house used to be at the top of those stairs. Um, here's a beautiful Victorian, came down off of its foundation, um, over $300,000 just to put it back on its foundation. We have an earthquake brace and bolt program that's available throughout um, Northern California in the Bay Area. We provide up to a $3,000 grant. Uh, we, we are about six to $7,000 is where that retrofit is in the Bay Area. And um, that would qualify for between a 10% and 25% discount on CEA earthquake insurance. So that's how significant it is to reducing the damage. Earthquake brace and bolt registration is not always open, but you can give us your email and we'll let you know when it is open. This is what we're doing under the house. $3,000 to essentially put in anchor bolts from the side or from the top plywood clips at the top. So essentially holding that house on its foundation. We're also introducing a program earthquake soft story or ESS at the end of this year much more pertinent to San Francisco, of course, because it's that soft story damage for the single family house. So you take out all the elements that resist earthquakes, which are walls. When you introduce the, um, the, the automobile, these houses went through 1906. Those beautiful houses that are on your website uh, are now less, less strong than they were in 1906 because of the advent of the, um, the garage door and essentially clearing out all the walls on that first level. This is what we do is we go in and we put in a steel column, we put plywood, we put in a new foundation little bit more expensive, but this is a much more damaging um, type of, of uh, problem. It can lead to partial or full collapse. And we don't know how much this grant will be yet, but watch for this one as well. And I wanted to make that quick so that we have lots of time to uh, answer questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing and stop with that. Let me jump in on the soft story. So mm -hmm. realtors are used to the soft story because oh, seven, eight years ago, maybe even more now, San Francisco passed a soft story ordinance. I'm sure you're very aware of it. Yes. And that soft story ordinance was, uh, it started out as more than four units. And then I think in the end, it included four units. Uh, I don't think it included less than four units. I, I no, forget. It's now. five and above. Five and above. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so the big question was going to be, when was it going to be what we refer to as residential one to four? And it was supposed to be phased in. And that yeah. just never happened. 
it doesn't mean that these homes are any less safe than the fives or mores, right? They're right. the exact same construction. They have this soft story, which is a large opening on the first floor with wood framing. That's right. Right. More than one story, no shear wall typically, right? And so when the earthquake comes, the flex, right, flexes it off its foundation and yep. off into the collapse. Right? Exactly. Um, but not that expensive to remedy. Is that what you're telling us? Well, I will tell you that the, the, the retrofit that I described is about six to 7,000 is the cripple wall. So that's when you're going into the, and there are some of these houses, if you think St. Francis Wood, you know, but of course the whole East Bay, you think, you know, those bungalow houses, all the construction between the world wars is, is the EBB house, the earthquake brace and bolt house. The soft story houses in San Francisco are more expensive because you have to put in foundations. You have to put in a steel column, typically plywood around the rest of the walls. So those are going to be more in the 10 to 15,000, we think. Um, we're going to be getting some some costs soon. We're doing some cost estimation. So ESS is not coming with a mandatory ordinance, but rather we're coming with a solution. We're coming with a, a code standard that you use to retrofit and some addition and some uh, um, uh, assistance in funding. Um, it's going to be a pilot program, but we're gonna, definitely going to be in Alameda County and in San Francisco, and that's the end of this year. And may I offer this solution also? Because if this is going to be legislative you should also slip into any bill some program where contractors can get certified quite easily, right? And so that someone with a high school education who has a little bit of knowledge and goes through the certification, right, can get this thing done and we can start to standardize these prices. That would be great. Yeah, well, we are gonna be coming out with training for, for uh, engineers, for building departments and for contractors on this particular issue. So I, I'm with you on that. We need to get the workforce up to speed. Let me jump in and ask Aaron and Jude a question here, which is when you're issuing a policy, whether it's a commercial policy or a residential policy, what do you do, if anything, to look into the physical components of the building, right? So is there an inspection? Is there a discussion regarding soft story? And this is also important for the timing of all of this. One of the things that we've been hearing uh, as realtors, this very scary concept that we're getting uh, a binder for a policy only to find out either just before close of escrow or within 90 days after close of escrow that the policy gets canceled because, oh no, it is in fact too close to something. Or now we've come out and we've inspected a little bit more and now you're sitting without a policy. Uh, or worse, it gets, uh, we put in our, uh, we made a non-contingent offer because our client had a, con uh, a consult with you. We have a $100,000 deposit at issue. And just before close of escrow, I'm sorry, we can't issue the policy and the lender won't close. Okay, that's the big question. Jude and Aaron, tell us. Um, from my standpoint, we are te technically the field underwriters. So we, you know, we do the assessment. We kind of have an idea of basically when farmers puts us a training, what are they exactly looking for as well? So um, when I look at homes and stuff like that, um, I try to make sure that it is something that's acceptable. If I see, you know, anything like, you know, like the roof looks like it's falling apart, the house doesn't look like it's in great condition, I typically will let the client know, hey, I'm going to be upfront with you. This is something that will not go through with us. Um, if I insure this for you, you might end up running into this issue where you might end up getting canceled in 90 days or something like that. So I always try to make my best effort in making sure that the home is acceptable within farmer standards um, by looking at Google Maps, going you know going to the property you know if if, if I'm available, um, and you know getting current pictures from you know the listing or from the realtor or the client themselves to basically reassure me, hey. You know, like if there's something that's hard to see, for example, something on Google Maps that looks really pixelated and, you know, I need some clarification, I'll ask the real, I'll ask them to talk to the realtor, talk to, you know, go out there and take a photo for me uh, if it's like, you know, out in Sacramento or something to make sure that this problem doesn't happen or occur. There definitely are going to be every once in a while, I miss a couple things, but, you know, those are very, very rare. Um, and we tried our best to make sure that we don't put clients in those situations. Is there a confirmation inspection after close? Right. So I get what you're saying, but after close, do they send somebody else out who's doing the quote unquote double checking? Typically within with farmers within the next 30 days, we're going to send somebody out there. Um, if it's anything, uh, if it's a high value home, meaning anything over a million dollars to rebuild the home, we will send someone out there to do an exterior inspection, 
um, and interior, uh, interior inspection used to happen, but because of COVID, we now just kind of do a video inspection where the client just, you know, puts up his phone or whatnot, uh, kind of explains the details about the home. And then we just upload some of the current photos of the home. Um, and then for anything under a million dollar, we do inspect every home as well too, but only the exterior. So it'll be a drive by, they take a look, take a couple of pictures. They take a picture of the roof only within whatever is public space. Meaning if you have a fence and we can't get to the backyard, we're not going to go back there but if there's no fence and we are able to get back there then we're just they're gonna the inspectors will walk back there and take a look and see what publics you know take a pictures of whatever they need to take a picture of what about this particular issue of soft story so if you're not issuing uh an earthquake policy do you care um not necessarily because it doesn't affect uh, the way they're going to be insured for the fire policy uh in regard regarding the soft story so um we do not look at that at all for um, for if we're do, issuing a fire policy. And what when is, I say fire, I mean you know fire, wind, hail, theft. The, the general homeowner's policy is what I'm talking what about. What about the idea of the uh, automatic shutoff valve? And the reason I'm thinking about this is because the joke is that okay, when the earthquake happens, let's hope that the pile of rubble burns to the ground, um, and so that you can make a claim against farmers and not against the California Earthquake Authority. What? I have actually heard of that. And uh, from my understanding, if there's an earthquake and it causes the gas line to rupture and your house explodes, the fire policy is going to pay for this. That's correct. It is. Yes. Yes. Yay. Okay. So I guess what we've heard is don't spend any money on a retrofit. <laughs> Make sure that you don't have an automatic shutoff gal. And an old fashioned gas lantern is the way to go. <laughs> now, uh, Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, and, and Janelle might know also, it, there's a time element in the policy though too, is there not? For, for an earthquake policy? Yeah, there, there's a, yeah. well, for, for an, an incident is 15 days. Um, so that if there's a- Half a shot. Oh, I thought it was, uh, oh, okay, okay. Um, uh, speaking, uh, speaking from a, a commercial point of view, the, uh, the situation with the uh, retrofit is based on price. So there actually are good earthquake programs commercially. However, to qualify for the program, you must be retrofitted. So you must have done the shear walls and you must uh, have the uh, apartment building bolted to the foundation. And uh, where, where the situation comes up is, uh, let's say it's, a, it's, a, it's an HOA and you know, uh, you know the, the board, you know, uh, doesn't know. And so there has literally been situations where I've had to go into the basement and take pictures of the shear wall and the bolting uh, to, to satisfy the program that, uh, that this in fact has happened. Because the, the pricing mechanism between, uh, between a retrofitted building and a non-retrofitted building is about at least 100%. Uh, so that's why the carriers uh, emphasize the the retrofit uh so much and that you have to prove it uh because it's really uh the, it comes down to the pricing mechanism yeah you know and, and we require that you you have a form signed by either an engineer or a, a contractor to get our, our up to 25 percent discount it, that that it's in fact retrofitted properly you can't just state that it's retrofitted and i think that really protects the homeowner as well because the voluntary retrofit has produced some interesting retrofits for commercial you're absolutely correct and what I found when I was a consultant is most of that was coming from the lender. There were lenders who would not lend on a commercial property uh, in earthquake country without a, a study that showed uh, that it might need earthquake insurance. It might need, need insurance plus a retrofit. So commercial, very definitely a different standard. You know, Janiel, well, we still have you. And I want to let everybody know Janiel needs to leave us at noon. Uh, and we really do appreciate your time. Well, we still have you. Let's talk about, no more joking, let's talk about what you can really do proactively. So let's just give a couple of examples. I am a, in a single family home. I am interested in doing this, right? I'd like my home to be nice. What's interesting is that I just spent two and a half million dollars on a regular house in San Francisco. It's nothing special. If I could have folded that money into the purchase, right? Literally, what's another 15 or $20,000 at that point? It's nothing. Right now, there isn't a program for that, right? So what I need would have needed to have done would have needed to have conserved a little more cash, maybe offered 10 or $15,000 more with a credit back from the seller so I'd have a little more cash 
so that this could be one of the first things that I could do, right? Yeah. Um, but let's say I really want to do this. Who do I call? What is my first call? Right. So, so we have a contractor directory, and I would I would refer everyone. So we have these these um, grant programs, but but let's go outside of that. And it's strengthenmyhouse.com that has information about the single family dwelling uh, vulnerabilities. We have a contractor directory. You can search with your zip code and we have a, an engineer directory. And it tells you what kind of standard you should use, what exact code standard you should do to retrofit. And so you can have one of those professionals come out and give you an estimate, um, you know, like just after you purchased or um, uh, the other thing is, I will tell you, it's not in the multiple listing. Uh, and, and I would hope someday it would be, and I'm sure all the realtors are going like this, Yeah. you know, but we do have standards. And if we could have on it, like this house was, was retrofitted to this standard, um, it would start to have value and it would start to have some meaning. And we have tools. We have something called FEMA P50 that, that could be used by a home inspector to inspect the seismic of vulnerabilities of the house. Um, but without, without a demand from the consumer, you know, there's there's no um, training being sought out by the home inspectors. So, you know, I think we, we just incrementally, the whole group needs to start to, you know, raise all boats. I appreciate that. One of the questions here, and I'm trying to go back and forth. Uh, what does a single column do for a house? Question mark. Someone seems dubious of the um, yeah. of the little thing that you showed. And you, so you showed a graphic earlier of the garage and a single column. And the question was, don't you need, in essence, a cage? And so do you tell us? Yeah. So if it's, if it's let's say it's just two stories, you, in fact, can get by with just one column. You might, if you have a two or three story single, uh, you know, storied house, might need a complete frame. Absolutely. Um, but for most part, you know, the, the one or two story houses can get by with just a single column. If you think about it, all the high rises that are still columns um, are holding up these enormous buildings one of them has a tremendous amount of strength and stiffness. And essentially they put in a new foundation, it's cantilevered up. And so what it's gonna do is it's, it's, it's fixed at the base and it's, it's, it's gonna just restrict the movement of that front. And you put a beam along the top that holds it all together. So it doesn't look like it, but um, that, or if you have enough room, you can put plywood either side of the door or the, these other elements that you can put in. Um, but that steel column uh, actually has the strength and stiffness to hold that house on its foundation. And depending on where that steel column needs to go, you're cutting into the existing concrete and you're putting a strong footer and That's it's right. going to be tied into that footer. Exactly. Right. Okay, great. Appreciate Typically it'll be tucked away in the corner so that it's not impeding the garage door access to the garage. And then one of the questions is, and, and I hate to tell you this, but this is some advice that I gave when I was a realtor to a client many, many years ago. They had just put down 5% uh, to get into a home. And then the question was, do they buy earthquake insurance? And I said, well, I hate to say this, but from a financial standpoint, I think you're gonna find that most of the policies have a 10% deductible. And that exceeds the equity that you have in your house. And I think that honestly, in the event of an earthquake, you'd be better walking away than paying. And at the time it was a substantial uh, amount of money. So there's this financial calculation that is often difficult. I think the good news is that now with the cost of construction, that calculation may have shifted quite a bit. Well, and I think that people forget that, um, you know, if I tell people, what if I were to tell you that you could have 50% of the replacement cost of your house in damage and their jaw drops and they go, and I go, yeah, you know, that Hayward fault happens right in your backyard. You have an older home. Um, you know, just think about having to, to patch and paint all of the plaster in your house, the, the stucco on the outside. Um, plus you might have, uh, you know, some breakage here and there, and um, you could have as much as 25% uh, surge, demand surge after an earthquake. So people are thinking of, well, it only cost me this much to paint right now. That's not the price you pay after an earthquake. So I, I will tell you that if, if your premium is coming out as high in our calculation, it's because our modelers are telling us that for a very large earthquake close to you, you could have a significant amount of damage. For the moderate earthquake, you know, the, that you're just outside of the downtown Napa and that Napa earthquake, you likely may not have seen a more than your deductible. I appreciate that. Um, well, I do have a question for you as well too. Correct me if I'm wrong, in 2019, I remember 
all a lot i mean a big 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 portion of the earthquake rates went down like almost 40 percent because you guys remapped basically all the risk for cea and i was like when my my earthquake and my home and my earthquake insurance went from a thousand to like 500 bucks i was like whoa and all my clients were like thank you so much uh, correct me if i'm wrong but i remember you guys remapped everything and lowered the rates and made it much more affordable than when my uncle had it back in the early 90s yeah. So, Aaron, we made a lot of changes in 2016, and that's why people should really go on to the premium calculator. And you can now get a 5% to 20% deductible. Um, but maps that just came out in 2000, and actually that was earlier than 2019, actually the most recent maps by USGS are making it go up again for those of us who live particularly, you know, along the Hayward Fault and places. So we're at, we're at the mercy of the modeling that happens by, you know, geophysicists. Um, and we're doing our best to keep prices down. The other thing in California that just kills us is replacement costs. I mean, you guys know this, you know, because, well, my God, the, you know, the real estate costs are uh, out of the moon, but, but the replacement costs go up as well every single year. And so California, it is just hard to cover this, um, this peril because it, the implications, if it happens in a, in a hugely densely populated older house area, like the East Bay, the damage is gonna be enormous. And, um, and so I always say, you know, it has to be right for your family. My kids in Oakland, we retrofitted their house. They can't afford earthquake insurance. My husband and I, you know, we can see in retirement around the corner, huge part of our portfolio, different story. It is interesting. Here's a scenario. What about the people who are in a condo? Uh, and so you're sort of at the mercy of what your condominium has decided to do, right? And so I'm in a sort of an odd condo complex where we have a hundred townhouses and we have four condominium buildings of 25 units each. So we have 200 units, a master policy that covers all of that. Um, but we don't have any uh, earthquake coverage. And, you know, and, and I guess the next question is, could we bifurcate it? Could it be for the, the big apartment style buildings and not for the townhouses? And maybe Aaron knows that question. I don't know. Um, and then how is, and I presume the reason we don't is because there's some thought that it would be prohibitively expensive. What, what are some of your thoughts for condominium owners? Or maybe the thought is we need to get them to do some retrofitting, right? These things were all built in the seventies. Who knows what they, how they were built. Aaron, did you well, want to wait? Uh, oh. I, you know, I was going to, I was going to say, uh, you know, I, I talked to a lot of, uh, of HOAs about this and you know, it goes back to the point that Aaron made, which is the unit owner's loss assessment. And so, you know, uh, an HOA can get a uh, earthquake policy at a much higher deductible uh, so that it covers a catastrophic loss. And, you know, unfortunately, though, you can't force the unit owners to carry the loss assessment. But if they all did... What do you mean by that, Jude? Well, loss assessment, you know, if uh, let, let's say it's, let's say you're in your example, it's a 200 unit uh, HOA, uh, you get an earthquake policy and you can go, you know, on a commercial earthquake policy, you can go as high as a 20, 20%, uh, 25% deductible. It's a big deductible, don't get me wrong. But if each unit owner had a loss assessment of 15%, then farmers, you, you know, State Farm, et cetera, is giving that money that would go towards their portion of the deductible. Okay, so it, so it makes it. Cost assessment is basically a supplemental policy that will help pay for that 20% deductible. Correct. Is that what I bought the other day when I bought my supplemental policy? No, from my understanding, loss assessment covers if the HOA is billing the individual owners. So, for example, yeah. the entire bill, the entire uh, HOA collapses and they say hey um you know for example for your property let's just say if everybody got earthquake insurance and had a hundred thousand dollars which is the maximum you can get on a loss assessment and there's 221 units that's 22 million dollars if everybody had that amount and they did a, an assessment and says hey uh is 22 million dollars going to be enough to rebuild this property maybe so now you guys all can rebuild the property however the ones that don't have the loss assessment or don't have the earthquake policy they're going to be basically billed and if they don't have that money, they're going to have to take out a second mortgage, take out money out of the retirement, et cetera, you know, to pay for that loss that the HOA is billing them for. That's not including rebuilding the inside of their unit. That's only the HOA's building property, the roof, exterior, common space, foundation. 
Well, I'll use the word disaster, pun intended. You know, a, a second disaster on top of this disaster would be either there isn't um, coverage or many people don't have this and you're trying to get the whole building built. And now you have half of the people who don't have coverage and no means of coming up with $100,000. Who's going to lend, right? What equity do they have in this house, right, at this point? Um, and so now they're all walking away. And now the question is who's buying up these, these right, and, and at pennies on a dollar. Maybe their neighbors are buying, right? It, it will be terribly complicated and there will be a lot of heaps of rubble sitting there because of this financial difficulty. How did that happen, Janelle, in when uh, 19, what was it, 89, just before I moved out here, in the 89 earthquake in the marina, why didn't we have heaps of rubble sitting there for a, lot, a long time based on these same economics? You know, um, I, I think that the marina district is, is, not a, is not a socially vulnerable district, I could say. Okay. Um, yeah, it, you know, and, and I will tell you that one of the, you know, we just opened uh, supplementary grants for earthquake brace and bolt because, uh, you, you know, the 50% of Californians are renters. I mean, this is why San Francisco passed the ordinance is they realized that 50% of or 65% of San Franciscans were renters. Um, and some of them very socially vulnerable and others very uh, transient. You know, somebody who has a very good education and works for a, you know, a dot com or, you know, big tech is just going to move. And, um, and so they said, we cannot leave this residential vulnerable. And um, the Marina District, I think just had means, but you put that into a community that's socially vulnerable. And, you know, we have, um, you know, abandoned ghettos for decades. And we have those people who are tr uh, uh, transplanted like they were after Hurricane Katrina. So um, these are really important residential um, decisions, particularly in a state that is already impacted in terms of housing. Appreciate that. Thank you. I do have a question for Janelle as well. Same, same, similar question to uh, Daniel regarding the loss assessment for condominiums. So, like for example, his condominium, a traditional condominium with hundred units, two hundred units, everybody gets a hundred thousand dollar loss assessment that'll cover up to two hundred twenty-two million dollars, which should be enough sufficient to rebuild a, a building, a commercial building. However, what I don't, what I would like to know is, is CEA going to come out with? Um, with a product specifically for non-traditional condos, like people that condo convert like a Victorian. Because if you have a three unit condo, even if you max it out at a hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollars is not gonna build you anything. Uh, like there, you're not gonna get anything out of three hundred thousand dollars. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if, if CEA is gonna eventually come out with a product made for the non-traditional, um, you know, condominiums. Well, the, the reality is if you are um, less than less than five units, one to four units, you can get an insurance policy if you're residential um, with the CEA. We were set up to do single family, single families defined as one to four units. And for a retrofit as well, um, you know, one to four units is considered single, single family. There are the unusual, you know, I think of San Francisco with uh, commercial on the, the bottom floor and residential on the top. Um, that the CEA would not insure because of that commercial space. Those guys are in a real middle middle space, cool. exactly. But we were just set up legislatively to only cover the one to four unit. Well, let's talk about that for a moment, Janelle, and you may know this, you may not. When San Francisco finished their retrofit program, the five plus, that soft story program, I think they crossed off most of those units got crossed off the list. Is that fair to say? When you say crossed off the list, as in they were retrofitted? Yeah, they really were retrofitted. San Francisco has been very successful with their their um, their program. Yeah. Okay, so now here's the question: That was five plus. What does that mean? What's left in terms of soft story? Does that mean that is half the housing stock one to four? Right. Have have we only crossed off the list a small portion? Right. So first and foremost, there's some, something I like to call structural triage. In that, when you're looking to spend, um, you know. Uh, Taxpayer money, which is what you're, you, I mean, essentially, these folks are individual building owners were spending their money, right? Um, they were trying to get the, the most vulnerable of the buildings. And those were the taller buildings, the heavier buildings with more units. Um, our earthquake soft story program is, in fact, going to target those one to four units. And once again, it's not mandatory. It's still going to be, it's going to be voluntary, but we're going to, to bring money to the program, not demand, you know, a, a, a mandatory program. So, um, and we are in a position to utilize FEMA funding to put that into it. And we think that if we get this pilot 
successful in San Francisco, that we will be able to get additional funding from FEMA and we're gonna be targeting exactly those kinds of houses, that one to four units. Um, I have not seen any city in California that's looking to do any mandatory uh, ordinances for one to four minutes. Including San Francisco, because uh, allegedly that was originally their plan to scrap that. Well, I believe that I, I've seen that the CAPS um, Community Action Plan for Seismic Safety uh, had a 25 step, 20, you know, 20 year goal. And that one to four units is on there. But once again, structural triage, they started with, you know, unreinforced masonry buildings back in the 80s. And then they went to, you know, these dangerous multifamily soft story. And, you know, they're, they're looking at non-ductile concrete. They're looking at, you know, so they're, they're going like this down that line. And the nice thing is we can bring some funding into, you know, the, on their triage list, this one to four unit is down here. We're very happy to be able to bring some funding into that um, throughout California. Let's do this. We have 10 minutes left with Janine. Let's open it up to some questions directly for her. And then when we say goodbye to her, we're going to go into some other issues like fire and what those policies are looking like, right? Um, so who would like to ask Janelle a question? And I'm going to ignore the questions about the, um, the Millennium Tower because that's just fun and not really what we need to talk about, um, unless you want to volunteer something there. Oh, um, just, just if you Google, I think you can find some presentations by Ron Hamburger. They're very interesting. His name is Ron Hamburger? Ron Hamburger is the, the structural engineer who's leading the, um, uh, the, the repair or the okay. mitigation, let's call it. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of great McDonald's jokes there about the hamburger at all, but I, I'll, I'll make them another day. Um, okay. Who has a question for Janiel? Let me look here into the chat. And by the way, if I don't come up with one right away, it's not that the people aren't interested in asking questions, it's my inability to find them. Yeah, I can answer this one very easily. Yes. Uh, the hardest thing that somebody will do in our grant program is find a contractor, I admit it, but it's not impossible. We have, we have retrofitted over 16,500 homes and I don't think any one of those will tell you, oh, it was a snap, I just picked up the phone, a guy came out and he came exactly when he told me and he took two days and it was done. This is a two to three day retrofit, right? But the hardest thing a homeowner do will find be to find a contractor. Um, we, we've made it a little easier with this directory. Um, we've made it as easy as possible for, for the contractors. We've provided them with some FEMA training, um, but that will be the hardest part. But they are available, they are available. And, um, and also we, we haven't seen prices change too much in this pandemic. So um, we're seeing the retrofit costs come out the same. So do not despair, uh, but it will take some work. You know, not to be selfish, I'm looking through the chat and someone says townhomes are sometimes called single family attached. So I do have now a curiosity. Could I buy a regular uh, earthquake policy? I have what would be considered a traditional townhouse. There is a home on either side of me that is touching, right? Um, and I'm pretty sure my CCNRs say that the HOA is responsible for the structure and I'm just responsible for the the walls in. Is that basically the problem for why I couldn't buy my own policy? Aaron is shaking his head. I was going to say, Aaron has to answer that one. <laughs> yeah, so correct. So how your CCNR is structured, if you were responsible for the exterior, um, you know, uh, structurally, then you could get that traditional kind of, uh, you know, townhouse, you know, single family home type of uh, coverage. However, if your CCNR structure is yourself similar to a condominium, where you are only responsible for walls in, studs in, um, then yes, you would have to be subject to similar to a condo condominium uh, California Earthquake Authority policy. Okay, darn well, it! And it 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 causes uh, it causes uh, HOAs heartache uh, because within the CCNRs, uh, the CCNRs can require the HOA to to carry earthquake, and it's uh, it's brutal. That would be a super expensive HOA monthly due. <laughs> Imagine. Yes, <laughs> they already are. Janiel, out of curiosity, all of these other perils, right, fire in particular that we're seeing, how is that impacting the CEA, right? Is this a cascading event that is, that is impacting you as well? So um, obviously uh, any peril anywhere in the world affects reinsurance. So that's huge because that, that affects, of course, our policyholders because their premiums go up. Um, wildfire uh, is, is an issue. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why is, is that it, it it's such a big issue in California that you have to be careful that earthquakes are, the probability of an earthquake is, is so much less that you have to keep saying, hey, this is a problem, hey, this is a problem. 
Um, but I will tell you, fire following earthquake is is a, the same problem as as wildfire or that you know um, urban wildfire inter interface in that it's a community problem. And I used to be a little bit against um, gas shutoff valves, and I'm changing my tune. Um, because it's a community problem. And if, if I retrofit my house, I, I reduce the, the two top reasons that my house might catch on fire. I'm, I'm gonna keep it on its foundation, I'm gonna brace my water heater. But if my neighbor doesn't, all bets are off, right? It could be a, a catastrophic wildfire in the, in the community. So that has to be looked at as a community problem. And so we want people to collectively retrofit their homes, collectively look into gas shutoff valves, um, and then all those other wildfire interface issues, because you know you can't deal with that one on an individual basis. And the selfish concern for the gas shutoff valve was always that in the event of a minor earthquake, my gas is off for a week by the time PG&E figures this thing out. It, it is, you know, and it and it's really kind of a sad problem because we have the technology to have smart, um, you know, they put smart meters in, but they weren't smart enough. They're kind of quasi smart. <laughs> Uh, which is a shame because it could have been better. That's me. Yeah, yeah. We kind of have we have uh, you know kind of middle smart right. leaders. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Appreciate that. Anything else for Janiel? We are at her limit. All right, Janiel. We are going to declare this an absolute success. I really appreciate you being here. Honestly, for taking the time. One of the last questions was: Are the bookcases behind you strapped to the wall for earthquake safety? <laughs> Yes, they are. Um, if we were at home, I'd, I'd be embarrassed to, to say we're going to get to that soon. Two structural engineers and what I sit in front of at home is not. So I've just stated that to Pamela and she's going to send me an email tomorrow to remind me. Of the strapping and the bracing. About and, strapping oh, at home. Here's the last question. It seems like we're overdue for an earthquake. Statistically, yeah. statistically speaking, that's been a long time, has it not? That's right. There is a near certainty of a magnitude, the size of uh, an earthquake, the size of, of Northridge or bigger happening somewhere in California in the next 30 years. That's a near certainty. Um, when you look at individual faults, San Andreas Fault reduced the risk in, in to the San Francisco area, but Hayward Fault over 140 years ago, and that's about the return period. So the Hayward Fault is the more likely devastating earthquake in the San Francisco Bay Area. Is there something called a Fresno fault and we could funnel them that way? You know, I had somebody literally send me an email suggesting that we glue the faults together. And I was trying to tell them that all that would do is, was send the stress elsewhere, like out into the Central Valley. And they love the idea of sending the stress to Sacramento. Right, to Sacramento, right to the capital, in fact. <laughs> exactly. Lex, was this person's name Lex Luther by any chance? You, you know, I don't know, but it was one of, one of my favorites. All right, Janelle, Janelle, we are declaring it a success. Pamela, thank you for organizing. We are very grateful to have had you. We hope that you come back. Thank you all. I really appreciate this opportunity to spread the word. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye -bye. All right, Aaron and Jude. All right, why the hell are earth, I'm sorry, why the hell are policies so damn expensive? Let's get off earthquakes for a moment. Let's talk about what we can really expect Jude, the good news about Jude is you can shop at any place. You are an independent broker. You know what's out there in the marketplace. No offense to Aaron. Aaron is a farmer's man, right? Um, so you may not be as aware of some of the other things that are out there. But let's talk about a, a regular policy. I wasn't kidding when I say that I've been told that if you buy a three or four million dollar house in Montclair, which is just a regular nice house these days, that your annual premiums are 50 grand. Is that true and how is that possible? Yeah, with personal homes, I mean, basically what, you know, how insurance works is it's a collective pot, right? Everybody puts money in, everybody takes money out. And if they have to pay out more, you know, more than what's in the pot, then next year they, they have to replenish that pot, make sure that the reserves are in there and they have to up everyone's rate. So we put in $100, everybody puts in $100. And then we take out $110, then next year we had to collect $110. Therefore, the rates go up. And so collectively in California, we've just had enormous, crazy wildfires the last five, six years. And I remember when I was, you know, before I even started this, we weren't talking, we didn't have orange skies and stuff like that. But now it's like every year it's happening. We have an orange sky. And these wildfires are starting sooner and sooner. Like this year, I think in January, there was already fires in SoCal. So those, if, you know, those claims, those, you know, those devastating claims are basically, you know, raising rates for everyone across the board. What about the history? So, so, so Jude, why don't you answer this one? 
those rates are based on mapping. Is that right? And whose mapping is that? And how granular does that mapping uh, get? Is it neighborhood by neighborhood, house by house? Jude, tell us what's up. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely house by house. Um, I mean, they, uh, as Aaron also knows, I, you know, a carrier will tell you, uh, you know, you've got a clear brush, you know, to 200 feet, and we can see that it's not cleared. And so you, you better clear that brush. Uh, but the, uh, which is this concept of reinsurance. And so this idea for everyone of reinsurance is uh, a, a travelers, a Liberty Mutual, a, a whoever, they do not take 100% of the risk on themselves. They sell a piece of the risk off uh, to a reinsurer. And what's happening is now you got to think about reinsurance not just locally, but globally, right? Because reinsurance carriers are a, a global operation. And so what the, the reason why that Montclair home is 50 grand is because uh, reinsurers have looked at it and they won't reinsure it. And so the carrier has to look at that and they have to go, oh, okay, well, if I wanna insure that home in Montclair, I need, uh, to get the rate for that. And so that's, so it's really uh, the combination of, of local underwriting issues uh, with weather and worldwide, uh, what is happening in the reinsurance market. So in those particular policies that we're talking about, one of the reasons the premium is so high is because there isn't reinsurance. So they really have to say, okay, what is our collective risk on these in the event of catastrophe? That is right. Uh, and so does this mean that the, from what I understand, Florida is a freaking joke right now with all kinds of crazy insurance litigation and, and half of the um, insureds are going bankrupt there. So all of that is impacting us because of reinsurance? Yeah. Florida's yeah, rates also, actually are yeah. going so up the, the, maybe. The oh, good. Jude, you go no, first. No, go ahead. Dude. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And Aaron? So, yeah, with Florida, um, one of the biggest impact over there is a lot of hurricanes happening, right? And that's covered by FEMA through your flood policy. And what's happening, why those rates are going ridiculously crazy is because um, the, the federal government has said, we're not going to subsidize anymore. You guys are going to pay the true rate you're going to have to pay because we keep rebuilding it and this keeps happening. And who's paying the bill? Uh, the taxpayers. So they're basically saying, hey, we're getting out of this. We're, we're gonna make you guys play, pay the true rate and not subsidize anymore, which is why Florida's rates are ridiculous, are gonna get, start getting ridiculous. It's my understanding that that true rate is actually helpful then for others who are uh, obtaining such insurance are in a lower risk. They're not spreading out the risk for everybody and it's based on how high your risk is. So if you're in a flood zone that's a hundred year flood zone, as opposed to something less, you still need the insurance, but your rates may have actually gone down. Yes. All right. That reminds me of something. I was looking at my notes from the previous insurance class, and it reminded me that flood and earthquake are totally separate from fire and what we're talking about, because they both have this federal component. And so farmers and all state and all these names that we know, they're not insuring those directly in the same way. So let's talk about our direct costs. Our direct costs are mostly, and the increases that we're seeing are mostly the perils of the fires, the issue of the reinsurance, and then increased replacement costs. Is that what we're seeing? Yep, increased labor costs, material costs, just everything in the Bay Area is expensive. So that reminds me, when I have a policy and that policy says that I have a million dollars uh, replacement coverage, my insurance broker was always sort of and said, well, it's really a million and a half. You have a 50% increase. So one question is, what's that all about? And what if I don't believe that number? If I say, well, there's no way this thing can get rebuilt for a million dollars. It's a duplex in San Francisco and it's 4,000 square feet. And that's just not the cost these days. If this thing burns down, it's more than that. Is it fairly cheap? to buy that incremental coverage? Is it like car insurance 
where I can pick a million dollar coverage, $2 million, $3 million, and pay for the, the incremental increase? Yeah, you can definitely increase your coverage if you feel that, you know, the agent that provided you the quote was like really lowballed, like, hey, I can't rebuild this house for $100,000. You, what you can do, a couple of things you can do is number one, your lender is not even going to lend you the money unless you have the proper insurance because you have to get it appraised. And the appraiser that goes in there will typically have their own opinion on market value. And what's the reconstruction cost? How much is it going to cost to rebuild this home? And so we can always negotiate with farmers or whoever that, you know, you can always use that appraisal to go to your agent and say, hey, the appraiser says it's going to cost this much. I think we need to bump it up. And they can I, usually bump it up that way. I have literally never noticed that. So on a typical single family home appraisal, it not only tells us the information regarding the appraised value of the home, but it gives a replacement cost estimate. Correct. And those are pretty accurate because they actually go inside your home, measuring everything, looking at all the different quality grades, looking at the type of material. Whereas for me, for the most part, I just go online and I just kind of guesstimate as close as possible. Oh, this looks like this type of hardwood floor. This looks like stucco. This looks like the, uh, you know, shingle roof. So on and so forth. They actually go out there and they look at it physically where they have much more detail than I have. So mine are just, my, uh, you know, kind of best guesses, but you know, I usually always try to make sure that I give my clients an extra 10%. And then the policy itself usually will give you something called extended replacement cost. That's your buffer in case inflation changes, in case of miscalculation, you know, so on and so forth. So they'll give you a buffer as that. So I personally give my clients a buffer on top of the buffer that they that the, that the company gives them as well. And Jude, does this vary for commercial? Is it a similar concept? Oh, absolutely. Very similar concept. Um, and it's, it's, and it's, it's, it's the same exact issues. I, I often argue with, uh, with carriers over a replacement cost because they're not here in our, our local market. And so, uh, you know, you, you often have to, to, to get a, 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 a rate per square foot that will really replace it here in, here in California. I can also imagine with commercial, it gets very complicated on what type of commercial, right? So we hear about class A, class B, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and who knows, very specific, very specific purpose built buildings, right? It must get complicated for you. Um, well, there's, yeah, yeah, it can be complicated, but uh, you know, the data, the data modeling, the data now is, is really sophisticated. So, um, you know, it, that, that really helps. I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty rare when a carrier hasn't seen a building. So let's talk about a couple of things and then we'll open it up for some questions. So one is I wanna go back to, I'm representing a client. My client wants to make an offer. That offer to be competitive needs to not include any contingencies. And our contracts remind us that our ability to evaluate the property should also include an evaluation of its insurability, the availability of insurance and the cost of insurance. And I need to do that before I remove these contingencies. And so I pick up the phone and I call one of you, right? So what do I need to tell my client to tell you to make sure that we don't get a big surprise before close of escrow? And one of the questions I have is, what about permitted versus unpermitted work? So when that appraisal comes back, which you have not seen yet, right? Because we're early in this process. When that appraisal comes back and says, hey, the entire lower level was built without permits, are we still insuring? Aaron, then Jude. Yeah, so for reconstruction costs, um, I mean, for, I mean, making sure that everything goes through if you have no contingencies on your purchase, um, there's no guarantee be, you know, that someone will say, hey, I guarantee you that we won't get canceled in 30 days, so on and so forth, right? Uh, because, you know, absolutely the inspector that comes out, they'll get the final say on it. Um, and that won't happen until after close of escrow, after we bind the policy. Um, uh, in regards to, um, you know, um, you know what, what you can do, what solutions that you have after that is, you know, if it turns out that, you know, it is a city house, you know, <laughs> uh, excuse my language, um, maybe you might want to get a builder's risk because it looks like your roof 
you know, you bought a fixer upper, that roof looks like it's falling apart. You might want a builder's risk because that will, you'll get a three month, six month policy. And then you'll still get the same amount, you know, we'll still let, you know, we'll still insure it for X amount of dollars for actual cost value rather than replacement cost. But, you know, pending that you get your roof redone. And then once your roof is redone, then we'll get your regular policy that you that, that you won't get canceled on. So lenders sometimes will accept that as well, too. Um, I wasn't aware of that. That's a, uh, so if I was in fact a builder, a flipper, right. Mm -hmm. And I'm buying something that is really in lousy shape. What you're telling me is I can get a policy. That policy may say that it's not habitable, but we're going to be working on it for three to six months. And Nine months, 12 months, yeah. Whatever it might be. Okay, but that's interesting. Okay. Yep. yep. So there are solutions to it. It's not cheap though, you know, because if, you know, they understand that, hey, if this thing is looking not so great, it, you know, like it could be falling apart next week, right? So, uh, you know, they, they're, take, they're assuming a lot of the risk as well too. So for them, they need to make sure that they're going to charge you enough premium to make it worth their while. Okay, interesting. Jude, anything to add to that? Yeah, what I wanted to add to that is uh, much like flood and much like earthquake, uh, there is a market of the last resort in California, as we know, that's a mm -hmm. California fair plan. So again, because lenders uh, do require do have the insurance requirement, fair plan uh, is there uh, in case the uh, insured can't find anything else. Now, with fair plan, uh, especially in certain areas, you do run you know, into difficulty with, uh, with the amount of insurance you can get through fair plan. Uh, so sometimes that is an issue, but it is there and it, it, it does act as a market of last resort. So just to make sure I understand that, and for everybody who's listening, the fair plan is run by the state. And so you're buying a policy from the state, the Department of Insurance, and I believe, in fact. Um, and yeah. so what you just said, which I think is extra interesting, is those plans might not have the benefits or the coverages that you want. So, and I'll just put it in the auto insurance world. The auto insurance world requires a minimum insurance policy. It's possible and, and then when you go to a, a private carrier, you have a huge option, array of options, right? And big policies, and you can buy into anything. The fair plan may offer you only one or two or three or four choices. The, the well, uh, the, the fair plan offers you fire only, but once you get the fair plan policy, then, a host of other carriers will will cover the gaps. Got so it. you get what's called a, a difference in conditions policy. And so, I'm sorry? Like personal liability, for instance. Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, water, dam uh, water damage, uh, liability, yes. Okay, I appreciate that. All right, so speaking of water damage, there's always this question about, okay, was that a flood, right? And so, Jude, help us with this. So I'm not in a flood zone. I don't have a, a, a federal flood policy, but it rains like a mother and it rained for four days and all of the rain is coming down from the hill behind me. It's bringing some mud with it. It's now entered my basement and now I have all kinds of water and mold and all kinds of things. Covered, not covered. I would, uh, <laughs> well, I, I would say, uh, I would say not covered. Oh, oy. Aaron. Yeah. So I'll kind of clarify just so that, you know, the, the viewers kind of understand the difference between water damage and flood. So it, typically water damage is covered on your policy, just not flood. Flood is a separate policy like earthquake. So water damage, typically a general explanation of it is water from the inside out and that happens suddenly, okay? So like a pipe burst, garbage disposal malfunctions, uh, maybe your contractor forgot to screw in the dishwasher properly and they missed the gasket or something like that and it causes water to spew everywhere. Or even if a lightning struck the roof and lightning is covered, but therefore it's storming, there's rain coming in, that's water damage, that's gonna be covered. Water, from the, water that comes from the outside into your home from the ground up, is typically going to be considered flood, mudslides, tsunamis, storm drains not being cleared out, and then water comes into your house from the outside in from the ground up. 
not caused by any other perils. That is going to be what the difference is between flood and water damage. Got it. And the um, commissioner of the uh, Department of Insurance made a nice ruling about a year ago that said that the mudslides and the water that was coming in from the mudslides that was caused because by the fire, yeah. the trees were gone from the fire. He made a little ruling and said, that's not flood. That's something else that's covered somehow. Uh, I'm not too sure about that one, but um, from my understanding, I've I've always thought that that was considered flood. So I, I might be wrong on that. I think there was a special ruling to help people. Mm. It was and it was made politically. Let's put mm. it that. Way. Yeah. Anyhow. Okay. All right. What have we missed? Um, how do we keep? Oh, here's what we've missed. We're seeing a lot of homes that are in this higher, very high fire hazard zone, and now we're thinking for our very first time. Oh, defensible space requirements. And so defensible space requirements for the most part are not a point of sale requirement. So they're not required to be done, but there's now this point of sale disclosure and an agreement that the buyer has to do the defensible space work if they're in a higher, very high fire hazard zone within one year of the close. And so I don't know if buyers are really doing that and are insurance companies interested in checking on it and if I can prove through a certificate with the local fire department that I am in compliance with defensible space or home hardening for that matter, does that get me a discount? Yeah, for the most part, if you do, you know, if you're in a high fire risk, I guarantee you someone will go out there and if they see that it's a you know high brush area, you got tree limbs hanging over your homes and stuff like that, brushes not cleared out. Um, they will they will cancel you or they'll notify you. Hey, you need to get this cleaned up and you got 30 days to fix this. Otherwise, we're going to cancel you. Um, so those are definitely things that they will be looking at. So that's interesting because that might be the impetus for the buyer. So the buyer has taken on this contractual responsibility to do this after close of escrow. And what may really happen now is in that first 30 days that they own the property, the farmers sends a representative who says, yeah, you got to do this. And now they're actually going to do it. Interesting. Yeah. One of the things you actually can look at in terms of discount is um, if you're in a high fire line uh, area, like, you know, like Mill Valley or something like that, uh, Santa Cruz, um, when you, when your clients are looking at homes, you can check one thing for them that can help them get a discount on their fire policy. Check yeah. out if they are in a fire wise community. I don't know the criteria or how you get qualified on the community, but if you are in a FireWise community, then you can actually get a discount on your California Fair Plan when you purchase your last resort fire policy that the only company will insure you. Um, so that is an option as well too. FireWise, FireWise. FireWise, correct. Let me, I'll put it in the chat. FireWise. Jude, what were you gonna say? Oh yeah, I, I was just gonna say, I, I don't want, I, I wouldn't wanna give anyone the expectation that if they're in a high fire area that they are going to get anyone to cover a new policy besides fair plan. I mean, I do not, there are, there are really very, very, very few carriers who are willing to do this right now. So let's, let's go there for a moment. So if my home shows up in a higher, very high fire hazard zone. So we have this thing called an NHD report, natural hazard disclosure report, right? Um, and we have this AB38 that they're all looking for to see is it a high or very high fire hazard zone. And the mapping comes back that it is in one of these state high or very high fire hazard zone, different from a county level. You're telling me that for the most part, good luck getting a policy from an individual carrier. Yeah, and, and the care, and, and you, you know, uh, from what I see, see, Carriers will say, hey, we are in the California market and we are writing policies. But the reality I see is that you send it to them and they decline it. I mean, so. So how does my buyer who calls one of you, calls Jude, who calls Aaron, he says, okay, it turns out it's in a higher, very high fire hazard zone. I'm about to remove my contingencies, but I need a quote to know how much it's going to cost me. Can you help them with the, California fair house uh, fair plan quote can you be a conduit to, to purchase that and help them understand what it'll cost them and then do all the add-ons for them yeah definitely yeah. um I would recommend though if you you know if you're in if you're buying in a high fire line area maybe check out the fire line score um typically anything um 
10 and below fireline score 10 and below I, you, it's possible to find a carrier that will take on the full package meaning fire water damage theft liability etc cetera, etc cetera. it's possible but anything over 10 if it goes from 10 to 21 they consider that extreme fire line which even the carriers that i have access to that that do the high fire line stuff was like nope no way we're not touching it um then you'd have to go to the california fair plan and get like an absorbent crazy you know premium policy so i have never heard of the um the scale that you just described whatever <laughs> yeah never ever heard of that where 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 is that scale um, so you can look up the ISO scores, ISO, and that's all determined by the fire department. And what they do is they deem, hey, this area is fire line score, and they score it themselves, they score this or that, and so on and so forth. And if it, you know, and and you can actually look that stuff up, or you can ask your agent, we can look that up and let you know what your fire line score is. Typically for farmers, we don't like to touch anything greater than a three. Wow. Yeah. If it's a commercial space, we'll do a six. Um, but with now reinsurance stepping away, it's hard to even get a six. I might even be, might only even be able to get a five. When reinsurance is available, then we can probably push it to a six. So let's say I come to you, I'm in a higher, very high fire hazard zone somewhere in the Bay Area. By the way, San Francisco has none. That's good news. So let's say I'm in Orinda, Moraga, something. Um, and I'm in a higher fire, fire, high fire hazard zone, about to spend $4 million on a nice single family home. And you're going to be, are you going to be directly telling me, by the way, farmers won't be doing the fire. I'm sending that out to the fair yep. plan. And that cost is $38,000 a year. And here's the other add-ons and your total premium is 54 grand. Correct. If somebody came to me and they were in Santa Cruz or Orinda, high fire line, I punch in the address right away. It'll pop up a fire line score for me. If I see that, hey, it's a nine or a seven, I would tell the client, hey, just keep in mind, this policy is going to have to be separated. You're going to have one policy with farmers. You're going to have one policy with the California Fair Plan. This is the offer I'm going to be able to give you. Fire, you know, fire is going to, you know, fire, lightning, smoke damage, uh, wildfire is going to be covered by California Fair Plan. We're going to cover everything else, excluding fire, you know, what California Fair Plan covers and flood and earthquake. Uh, so we'll cover the wind, hail, theft, water damage, uh, tree falling on your house on the farmer's policy. And then the far, and then everything else will be separated. And, and oh, and, and by, by the way, you're going to, on the Fair Plan policy, you're going to be underinsured because Fair Plan tops out at 3 million. Okay. Combined. Three million combined, right? Yep. Combined what 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 casualties combined? So replacement cost and where I'm going to live cost and everything else, and contents and everything. Total dollar yep, figure. Fan. They will not send you a check yes. more than three million. Okay. So if I just bought a five million dollar house, I better hope only a half of it burns down. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So guys, what have we missed? Because we're coming to the end. And I want to declare this thing a success and ask if people have any further questions. Um, is there anything we missed that we should be doing to help our clients make this thing cheaper, give them more certainty, assist them in, in knowing what their costs are going to be earlier in this process? Yeah, definitely reach out to your agent. You know, they should be able to give you a quote on the cost. Um, you know, definitely do, you know, uh, things, you know, defensible space, you know, um, you know, seismic retrofitting, if you can't bolt and brace your home, you know, it, you know, it's, it, it's definitely going to help protect your home. There's no guarantees, but you know, the best thing is you're spending millions and millions of dollars on your home. And that's their biggest, a lot of times that's your biggest asset. Um, so you want to make sure you protect it. Um, another portion of it that I wanted to bring up also is liability, you yeah. know, you spend so much money on this house. You spend so much money on protecting the house from fire, earthquake, whatnot. What about some mailman that slips and falls on your driveway that sues the hell out of you? You don't want to have to sell your home and, you know, and, and to pay to pay his medical bills, his lost wages and his pain and suffering. That might end up breaking you if you don't have that type of money. So make sure you have a good liability or an umbrella policy, too, for any homeowners or landlords out there. And so my recollection is that my liability is only 300 grand because I have a $5 million umbrella policy. And so we need to, to trigger the umbrella policy, we need a minimum liability coverage. And is that number $300,000? 
carrier by carrier is a little bit different, but yes, for the most part, on average, I think most carriers are going to be 300,000 minimum in order to qualify to trigger the umbrella to be used. And when my dog bites somebody, isn't it true that either my homeowner's policy or my umbrella policy is covering that also? You'll want to look at the carriers because certain carriers will exclude certain dogs. So for example, farmers, we do not, we will have you sign a dog bite liability form uh, if your dog is one of the breeds on our list, uh, you know, pit bull, Rottweiler, so on and so forth. Don't get me wrong. I have a pit bull and man, that thing will lick you to death. That's about it. But, um, but, you know, but they still make me sign an exclusion form saying, Hey, if your dog ever bit anyone, we're not going to cover it. And so that's specifically, you know, so you want to look up those carriers. You can buy a standalone dog bite liability policy. No. And you let them know the exact breed. And that is a, that is an option as well. Appreciate that. And you know what I noticed the other day, you will have some additional add-ons. Uh, you'll insure anything, apparently. So I saw there was a cell phone coverage add-on and there was a uh, an identity theft add-on. Uh, and they were both another like, you know, $14 a month or something. Um, are there, what about jewelry? From what I understand, jewelry is excluded. And I was frustrated to learn recently that most of my art seems to be excluded. Tell me about that. Jude? Oh, I, uh, yes. Yeah, you have to, if it's art, if it's art, uh, you can uh, schedule it. It just needs to be, uh, you just need the appraisal. So uh, fine jewelry, uh, you know, uh, watches, uh, what have you. you, you can get it, you can get it insured. It just needs, uh, the, the carrier just needs to see the appraisal. Why is it that my artwork that's hanging on the wall is not personal property like my couch that it sits over? So let's just pretend the couch is a nice designer couch. It was $6,800 and hanging above it is a $2,500 painting and the fire comes. Somehow my painting isn't covered? Correct. So what you'll wanna do is you'll wanna look at your special limits on your personal art for your personal property on your policy jacket, which is that huge 80 page document that you usually get once you issue a policy and the insurance carrier sends it to you, which I wanna say 99% of the people have never read. Um, <laughs> if inside that package, you'll see something called a special, uh, special limits for personal property. They'll specify what limits they have for specific item. For example, uh, we have a, you know, person, you know, for your jewelry, we're going to cover up to a thousand dollars an item, no more than $5,000 total, unless you tell me otherwise you have a diamond ring, we add a floater on it and we'll, ex we'll ensure that specific diamond ring. If you need, um, you know, you just say general personal articles for um, for unscheduled jewelry, you have $10,000 and of, of jewelry, but each one's a thousand bucks. Then you let the agent know, and they can actually bump that up and you only pay the difference to increase your special limits. And they're going to, and that list, uh, typically the, um, the more common things I do see on that list are going to be jewelry, watches, and furs, firearms, um, car parts, um, and, um, fine arts, collectibles, you know, coins, stamps, that sort of stuff, you know, collectibles. Um, check with your agent. I always tell clients, I don't know what you own in your house. If you're, if it's a high ticket item or if it's important to you, ask me, I'll find out for you. And I'd rather you ask me than just assume it's covered because the last thing I want is a claim happening, you know, and then shit hits the fan. And just for fun, if my car is inside my garage and the house burns down and it burns the car with it, is it my homeowner's policy or my car insurance policy? car insurance you have to have comprehensive okay all right thank you and that's cheap coverage so i always make sure my clients have comp even if they don't have collision on older vehicle because it's so cheap to add on all right well i'm going to call this thing a success i'm going to say thank you very much to aaron and to jude i'd like both of you to put your email uh and your phone number back into the chat one more time so that the agents can steal it now Appreciate that. Thank you, Jude. I see that. And Jude, yeah, thanks, Dan. My pleasure. Jude, turn your Thank camera. Thank you for having us. One last time so that we can see your smiling face and say goodbye to you. There you are. All right. You're looking good, Jude. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks. Yeah, really? sorry about that. At uh, 1228 today, we are declaring this thing a success. I hope that everybody has a good and productive day. Go sell some real estate. Go sell some insurance policies. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye. See you, Aaron.